This week, the Stan Collymore Show comes to one of the qualifiers for the FIFA World Cup in Russia in the summer. It also hosted the first World Cup of the 21st century. Welcome to Japan. This is Tokyo, but we're going to be visiting Kobe to see World Cup winner Lukas Podolski. He won the World Cup with Germany. And we're going to go to the north of the country in Sapporo, famous for beer, but also for football, and a good friend of mine, Jay Bothroyd. Arigato. Arigato. Right, I'm delighted to be joined uh, by Ben Mabley. We're here in uh, salubrious uh, uh, surroundings <laughs> in uh, in Tokyo. J Sports uh, Studios, which uh, hosts the Premier League and, and many other sports in Japan. Uh, ben is one of the, the the main commentators, and he just happens to be an Englishman. So Hi. we're uh, we're getting together and having a, a good old chat about football. The J League now is 25 years yeah. old. How strong is it, in your opinion, these days? It's kind of hit some hurdles and reached a turning point in the last 10 years, I think. Until that point, I don't think there's been many examples around the world of a league that started essentially from scratch and got so good so quickly to the point where it was exporting players to AC Milan, to Inter Milan, uh, within the space of really 15, 20 years. When those star names went and the next generation didn't quite live up to the same standards, now it's what do we do? And so there's, I think there's a bit of a, a period where everyone has to be patient and maybe wait for the stars to come back before we can really get to the next growth phase. The J League was the first league that kick-started the A League in Australia, sure. the MLS that yeah. started about yeah. 1996. Yeah. So the J League really was the sort of the, the blue touch paper and, and the oh, experiment really? for many other new for leagues. Sort of em emerging leagues, yeah. You had the failed NASL in, in North America, of course. But um, yeah, I think in Japan now, even, even me, we have a tendency to be a little bit negative because it, of what's happening now. As I say, if you look at the first 15 years, to come from essentially nothing in terms of a footballing culture, that was quite incredible. You had, before the J League, you had a company league where teams that were called, literally called Nissan, you know, the, the, the car manufacturer, that team became Yokohama Marinos, now Yokohama F Marinos. But they were Nissan, they were, they were a company team effectively owned by the company. And in, in, in many ways, you had sort of plays, uh, players signed as, as professionals that were kind of ringers. But the culture of going to watch football, going to support your local team, thinking about the kids coming up in future, that didn't really exist. Japan was a baseball watching company, which is also more for a corporate sport. To go from that, the J League initially was heavily funded, so it was a big marketing success. But the real success they made was in the opening years, they, they knew that marketing and money wasn't going to be a long term thing. And so they made each club have a hometown rule and they them designate this is our hometown. We're not a company team, we're the, we the team that represents this town, this part of the country. This is, this is us. They are us. The J League started in 1993. That year, the national team had got to the point where they just missed out on qualifying for the World Cup. They then qualified in 98. They got to host it in 2002 and were pretty good, you know. And to do that in such a short period of time was quite incredible. And as you say, it influenced other places as well. Tell us a little bit about Japanese football culture, how important it is and how big the game here is now. The provincial towns, they got the sports teams and they also attracted a new audience. Baseball watchers in the past were maybe, they were, you know, company guys who go after work. Now this was not, this is a dividing line was drawn with companies. So no, this is a cultural thing. This is for the local people. And the level of commitment that you get from local supporters here is astonishing. And the clubs don't typically own their own stadiums. And so you can't leave your flags and your decorations there. So the supporters will turn up four hours before quick kickoff to be let in to decorate the stadiums. It's, it's something that, that the, the localities can be proud of. Thank Love you so well. much, I was gonna say, thank <laughs> you so much. It's a great honor to come to, uh, oh, to Japan right. and appear on your show as well. Right, let's go from Tokyo to Kobe, two hours on the world famous bullet train. So, we've got off the bullet train from Tokyo to Kobe, beautiful Kobe. And Alan Gibson is an Englishman, he's also an Aston Villa fan like me and an expert on Japanese football. He's been in Kobe for 20 plus years. So, when in Rome, 
do as the Romans do when in Kobe, eat beef. Let's go and talk some football and eat some beef. The, the 2018 World Cup. How far can Japan go? Again, it's, it's the same, you know, with almost any team. Of course, you expect Brazil and Argentina and Spain and whatever, maybe England to, to, to top the group and go through. But that group is, I mean, Senegal could win it. There's some good players playing for Senegal. Poland might collapse completely, Lewandowski might be injured. And Japan has, in their squad of 23, I presume there's going to be five, six, seven world-class players, in my opinion, that could easily be playing in the Premier League. Literally anybody can win that group, and if Japan are on their game, they can top the group. But they'll be happy with a, a win and two draws, maybe, and even a win and a draw would be enough. Seriously, that may be the best piece of meat that I've ever had. It finished last night in the Japanese League Cup and that man, Lucas Podolski, scored the two goals for Vissel Kobe. It's a warm down today. See the players just having a little stretch. Got an old friend here, the Telstar ball, which will be used at the World Cup. Let's have a chat with the man himself, Lucas Podolski. How have you found life in Japan and the football? It's good for now. You know, I'm now nearly eight or nine months here now. So it's okay. I think the life is very good. The food, of course. Uh, for my family as well, so we felt we felt very, you know, like how, how to say it, the friendly, friendly people. It's safety. Uh, it's no stress uh, in this city, uh, in this country. Uh, so of course, as I say, life is, is very good. Last season we finished at the ninth position. Uh, so I hope we can we can bring uh, this club to another level. But it, it takes time. This cannot be done everything in one year. So I think this needs, uh, you know, three to five years to bring the club to, to a top club in, in Asia. And this is our target. That's, our, that's why I'm here, to help the club on the pitch and off the pitch. And uh, I hope, you know, I can bring my experience, my quality uh, in this club. And then we will see what's, what's happened. How important is it for the J League to have players like you, marquee players that have been there, done it, won everything, to be able to push the league further forward? It's, it's important, but I think it's not the most important. You know, like uh, you look to China, you know, a lot of players moved there, I think for another reason, and a lot of players have gone already back. Uh, so I think it's not important to bring names in the country. Important is to, to make the, the Japanese players better to make the quality of the J-League better, to, to push the, the Japanese player more, to bring more uh, talented players to the, to the first team, to, to bring uh, more and more players to Europe from, from Japan. I think this is, this is the key point. Can Japan compete at a high level at a world championship? Uh, it will be interesting to see. Uh, I think is is a, is a lot of quality in the J League. You know, it's a nice stadium around. Uh, the supporters is good. You know, uh, there's a lot of a lot of um, teams in the in the in the Champions League. Last year, Japanese team won the Champions League. So I think the quality is really good in Asia. But still, as I said before, there's a lot of potential in in, in this country. Uh, of course, the baseball or other f sports, you know, are the, are the number one. But have you watched the baseball since yeah, you've been I, here? Are you I, a big I, fan? I, I, I watch it, but you see, to to the to the to the US, you know, there is basketball, there is football, there is uh, baseball, but there is still the soccer, and still they have the good marketing and they use a different thing, and I think this is as well the key point from from the J League. They have to use more the marketing side to bring. Uh, the J League, not to the distance to the baseball here, so a little bit closer. And I think uh, this is one thing as well. They have to they have to push the next years. 
it's hard for Japan, but still they can make it. I think, you know, it's interesting. This group is very interesting. Lucas, all it leaves me to say is thank you very much for joining me on the Stand Up Show. It's great to see you. Hope you continue having uh, a, a long and successful career and many goals to come. Thank you. Thank you very much for joining thank me. Thank you. This is the Sapporo Dome. It was one of the stadiums for the 2002 World Cup. And England famously played here against Argentina and David Beckham scored a penalty at that end of the pitch. Pitch technology in 2018 has come a very long way. In the World Cup in St. Petersburg, you'll see a retractable roof. You'll see great pitch technology, likewise in Kazan. And this is really where it all started in Sapporo. You see this track, this whole huge, area of concrete swivels moves around why come with me as we walk over to here usually you come into a stadium and the pitch would be here it's above my level i'm one meter 92 six foot four over there is the football pitch the whole thing comes up on pneumatics out into the open air We've been to Tokyo, we've been to Kobe to have a chat with Lucas Podolski. And today we're going to have a chat with a good friend of mine, Jay Bothroyd, an Englishman that's played all the way through the English divisions and leagues and the last three years has made Japan his home. Jay, it's great to see you. Tell us about Japanese life and Japanese football culture. I mean, when I first came here, they, they say, like, son means mister. And you know, when I'm, even when I'm on the pitch, people knock you down, kick you, and like, ah, oh, Jason, Jason, sorry, 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 and pick you up. Like, it's kind of like, really? Which you is an, the antithesis of playing competitive football, where yeah. you have you, you have to win, you have yeah. to do anything to win. Exactly, yeah. I think here, in a sense, it's still regarded as a game, whereas in Europe and England, you know, it's regarded as you know, life or death. You do anything to win a point. You know, you play against your friends. You know, you, you don't speak to them. You kick them. You, you leave them on the floor. You know, you try and get the, the edge over them. But here it's very respectful. You know, the way they treat you off the pitch is the way they treat you on the pitch. Your career, you've played for lots of different clubs and probably most notably early on in your career, which doesn't happen with a lot of English players, is you went and played in Italy. Then you've come to Asia and played for several clubs in Asia. That's unusual for an Englishman. I mean, when I was playing, you played in England, that was it. I know that there's been exceptions, people like Steve McManaman and now Gerard and Lampard gone off to the States, but that was unusual to go off to Perugia when you did. Is that always something that you wanted to do as a footballer, that not just play football, but play football in different countries and cultures? I mean, especially Italy. When I went to Italy, you know, me and, me and my dad are really close. You know, we obviously I used to take to all my games, you know, and we used to watch football on the weekend, go to football matches, even watch youth teams sometimes. You know, Tottenham's training ground used to be close to my house, so we used to go and watch the youth team there when I wasn't playing. And, you know, we used to watch uh, Italia football on Channel 4. And Gazetta football Gazetta, Italia. Yeah, exactly. And that's what, you know, kind of got me into it. And I was thinking then, like, you know, I always want to go and play in Syria. I had the opportunity to go. It was kind of like, of course, I didn't want to leave home and my family. You know, I, I just had my son. But it was like a dream that I wanted to achieve. And for me, I've never really been a person for home. Home to me is where my family is, mm. you know. So when my family comes to Italy, Japan, wherever I've been, that's home for me. In Japan, traditionally, you know, you think of... Uh... Shinji Kagawa, of course, uh, Junichi Inamoto that you've got at the club here. The midfielders suit the Japanese mentality. Technically very good. Generally, if you look at the players in Europe, they're all kind of like, they play number 10s, or they're wide players, or they're fullbacks. You don't really see like a centre half or a defensive midfielder that puts in tackles. They're all kind of like luxury players almost. And that's the, that's the high quality players they produce here. And then they go abroad, you know. If you look in the J-League, a lot of the defenders are Brazilian, South Korean, mm. you know, where they're more aggressive, they're bigger. You know, Japan, look at the rest of Europe now, especially the best teams like Barcelona, Man City, yeah. you know, and you'll see teams try and emulate that kind of style. Yeah. So, like, they're passing out from the keeper, you know, building up.
Japan is in the World Cup in a group with Poland, Colombia and Senegal. Can the national team really make a dent on a World Cup? Well, that's, this is what I said, you know, I've had this conversation with many people and journalists and players. I don't see why they can't, you know, because, again, technically they're very good players. But I think what holds the Japan national team back is the mentality. Like I said, to them, it's a game. You know, they should qualify every year. You know, they're playing against, no disrespect, but they're playing against teams like Thailand. Iran, you know, Australia, Iran, yeah. the big boys aren't they, Saudi. Yeah, but, so they should, yeah. they should qualify for every tournament and, you know, with ease, really. But when they qualified this time, it was like they were celebrating like they've won the World Cup. And to me, it should be like, OK, yeah, we've qualified, you know. I want to see them do what, you know, South Korea did. Yeah. You know, when they went to the Quarters, semi-finals, yeah. yeah. Quarter-finals, yeah. And they weren't expected to. They weren't expected to, but they got there, and it's like, obviously, hard work, competing, you know. If you look at the group, don't get me wrong, they got, like, Senegal, Poland. They're, they're good teams, but I wouldn't say, no, nah, they're, they're definitely not going to qualify. It's a group that they can get out of. But, you know, in the World Cup, you need to start well. You're very opinionated, and you have that broad knowledge of the game, having been around the world. What do you want to do post-football? To be honest, I never really thought about coaching or management. To me, I, I dedicated my life to football from like nine years old, you know, like you do. And, you know, I love the game, don't get me wrong. But I never really thought about it until I came here. And I thought, you know, when I was here, I'm thinking, actually, I've worked with some really good managers. You know, Arsene Wenger raised me. You know, I worked with Mark Hughes, Harry Redknapp, and, you know, when I was in Italy, I had a good manager. I was, obviously, I got called up to England one time, and I see the way Capello put sessions on and whatnot, and I feel like I do have some knowledge. So I was thinking, if I am going to be a manager or a coach, I would like to do it here. Because do you think it's a good place to, to do your coaching badges, to get good support? Yeah, I think... Football I, clubs that have got good facilities and infrastructure? Yeah, I think so. I think, you know, I've, I've been, I'm, I'm going to start it this year. For me, my dream was to play in the Premier League, which I've done, earn a lot of money, which I've done, play for my country, which I've done, play abroad, which I've done. So for me, I can look back at my career and say, I've achieved what I set out to. Don't get me wrong, I made mistakes, a lot of mistakes on the way. We all do. Where my career could have gone a different way and I could have played longer and I, I did waste a lot of time, you know, messing around, you know, going out partying when I should have stayed in. And that's a part of learning and, and living. You know, you have to, you, you learn from your mistakes. How you approach a season? For me personally, of course, I want to I wanna score goals. I love to score goals. But for me, like, where I, when I was younger, I used to set myself a target at the beginning of the season. I said, oh, I want to score 15 goals, I want to score 20 goals. But for me, if you can see you're not reaching that target, it starts to play on your mind. And you sit and you're all of a sudden failing your own, in your own position. Your own, yeah, exactly. Set forward the world's exactly. worst. Exactly. You need confidence. You need to, exactly. So for me, I always say to myself, I want to, you know, play well in that game. Yeah. This is what I need to do in this game. Um, so I always take each game at a time rather than look in the future. I prefer to, you know, I just concentrate on each day now. You know, I think the reason why I'm, you know, I've, I, I can still move around and run freely and, you know, run past, you know, 20 year old, 25 year old, is because I did waste a lot of time when I was, when I was young. You know, I was, you know, sitting on the bench and, you know, doing stupidness. And I feel like now, I'm at the back end of my career, I feel like, I value every single day, so I train hard, I keep myself in shape, I don't go out no more, I eat the right thing, you know, I, 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 I try to live a vegan life, you know, and... I don't. <laughs> you still look great. <laughs> to be honest, I'm not just saying this because you're here, like, when I, when I was growing up, my dad always said to me, look at Stan Collymore, Play, you know, he's a good... Go and party too much. <laughs> no, <laughs> you know, he said to me, like, on the pitch, you know, when you was playing for Forest and whatnot, obviously you as a player that I looked at and I was like, yeah, he's good. Because there wasn't many of you around yeah. where, like, normally it was like a typical centre forward, forward, long ball, hold, hold it up, up let off, off, get in the box. <laughs> and then you come along and you're turning people, dribbling, shooting, left foot, and it was like, that was a difference. And it was like, that's what I wanted to do. I, I never wanted to be one of these forwards that wasn't involved in a game, that would touch a ball in a six yard box and score a goal. For me, I want to enjoy it. I want to get yourself. on the ball. I want to express myself. I want to dribble. I want to be involved. I want to touch the ball like, you know, 30, 40 times a game. And I want to be a part of it. It's 
Great to see you. We've had a fantastic time in this country, and the one thing that I've learned is that the Japanese are very deferential, very respectful, and they take that onto the football pitch. Jay Bothroyd himself said it. Alan Gibson said it. Can they be ruthless enough, nasty enough, to win a FIFA World Cup in years to come? That's what I'm taking from our Japan trip. But now, relax. Time for a bit of fun before the next trip. The J League started in 1993. That year, the national team had got to the point where they just missed out on qualifying for the World Cup. They then qualified in 98, they got to host it in 2002, and were pretty good, you know. And to do that in such a short period of time was quite incredible, and as you say, it influenced other places as well. Tell us a little bit about Japanese football culture, how important it is, and how big the game here is now. The provincial towns, they got the sports teams and they also attracted a new audience. Baseball watchers in the past were maybe, they were, you know, company guys who go after work. Now this was not, this is a dividing line was drawn with companies. So no, this is a cultural thing. This is for the local people. And the level of commitment that you get from local supporters here is astonishing. And the clubs don't typically own their own stadiums. And so you can't leave your flags and your decorations there. So the supporters will turn up four hours before quick kickoff to be let in to decorate the stadiums. It's, it's something that, that... He won the World Cup with Germany. And we're going to go to the north of the country in Sapporo, famous for beer, but also for football, and a good friend of mine, Jay Bothroyd. Arigato. Arigato. Right, I'm delighted to be joined uh, by Ben Mabley. We're here in uh, salubrious uh, uh, surroundings <laughs> in, uh, in Tokyo. J Sports uh, Studios, which uh, hosts the Premier League and, and many other sports in Japan. Uh, ben is one of the, the, the main commentators and he just happens to be an Englishman. So oh. we're, uh, we're getting together and having a, a good old chat about football. J League now is 25 years yeah. old. How strong is it in your opinion these days? It's kind of hit some hurdles and reached a turning point in the last 10 years, I think. Until that point, I don't think there's been many examples around the world of a league that started... This week, the Stan Collymore Show comes to one of the qualifiers for the FIFA World Cup in Russia in the summer. It also hosted the first World Cup of the 21st century. Welcome to Japan. And this is Tokyo, but we're going to be visiting Kobe to see World Cup winner Lucas Podolski. You had, before the J-League, you had a company league where teams that were called, literally called Nissan, you know, the, the, the car manufacturer, that team became Yokohama Marinos, now uh, Yokohama F Marinos. But they were Nissan, they were, they were a company team effectively owned by the company. And in, in, in many ways, you had sort of plays, uh, players signed as, as professionals that were kind of ringers. But the culture of going to watch football, going to support your local team, thinking about the kids coming up in future, that didn't really exist. Japan was a baseball watching company, which is also more for a corporate sport. To go from that, the J League initially was heavily funded, so it was a big marketing success, but the real success they made was in the opening years, they, they knew that marketing and money wasn't going to be a long-term thing, and so they made each club have a hometown rule, and they them designate, this is our hometown, we're not a company team, we're the, we the team that represents this 
town, this part of the country, this is, this is us, they are us. Essentially from scratch and got so good so quickly to the point where it was exporting players to AC Milan, to Inter Milan, uh, within the space of really 15, 20 years. When those star names went and the next generation didn't quite live up to the same standards, now it's what do we do? And so there's, I think there's a bit of a, a period where everyone has to be patient and maybe wait for the stars to come back before we can really get to the next growth phase. The J League was the first league that kick-started the A League in Australia, sure. the MLS that yeah. started about yeah. 1996. Yeah. So the J League really was the sort of the, the blue touch paper and, and the oh, experiment really? for many other new for leagues. For sort of emerging leagues, yeah. You had the failed NASL in, in North America, of course. But, um, yeah, I think in Japan now, even, even me, we have a tendency to be a little bit negative because of, of what's happening now. As I say, if you look at the first 15 years, to come from essentially nothing in terms of a footballing culture, that was quite incredible.